Please stand. Let's join our hearts together as we worship God this morning.
Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Holy Spirit Anglican Church. I want to welcome those of you here, those of us joining us at home. And we are working from the Book of Common Prayer 2019. Those of you who were emailed in order of service can follow that. Or if you have a Book of Common Prayer, you can open to page 123. This is Trinity Sunday. And even though we're in white because of celebrating the Trinity, it is the first Sunday of ordinary time, which ordinarily is green, which we'll be seeing from next week through several months. Join me in opening acclamation. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Through our Lord Jesus Christ says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first in the great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Join me in the Gloria in Excelsis. Glory to God in the highest in peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us, your servants, grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory, O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's Word. Our first reading today is from the book of Genesis, chapters 1, and through chapter 3, chapter 2, verse 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. 
and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants in the field of the seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seeds according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the waters swarm, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for fruit. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for today is from Psalm 150. We will read responsibly by half verse. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in his holiness. Praise him in the armament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. 
Praise him with the lily in her heart. Praise him with the timbrels and dances. Praise him upon the strings and pipe. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. Praise him with the loud cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. My New Testament reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 through 14. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test, but we pray to God that you may not do wrong, not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when, when, when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. For this reason I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. Finally, my brothers rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of today's gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. Father and God, we thank you, Lord, for the amazing truths expressed in the scriptures that have been read for us this morning. Make our ears, our minds, and our hearts ready to be fed by the living word. We pray, Lord, for your anointing upon the preaching of the word and upon the receiving of the word. There might be that living word implanted to change lives. To the glory of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Excuse my dangling legs. I can't get it off without disrupting the microphone, so just try to ignore that. A common comment on my report cards as a child was can do much better, performs under his ability. As you can imagine, I quickly came to hate those words because my parents would bring them up repeatedly. The reason for them was those blank standard achievement tests. I consistently scored well on those tests, but just as consistently got C's and D's with a very few B's sprinkled in, maybe a very occasional A, 
that improved some in high school, more in college, and much more in grad school because I was finally studying something that I was actually interested in. But I tend to test well, and I've never really had much test anxiety, which I know can be a real problem for, for some people. I mentioned that to lead into a study of our New Testament reading from 2 Corinthians 13. Let me try to get this adjusted a little better. Let's try that. There the Apostle Paul challenges the believers in Corinth to test themselves, to see if they fail the test. And this test is far more important than any achievement test or final exam in algebra or English or history. This test is, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Is Christ living in, in your heart? And we're all going to have that test given to us when we leave this life and stand before God. Thinking about that, do you feel any test anxiety? Let's look at 2 Corinthians 13, beginning with the fifth verse, where the Apostle Paul wrote the church in Corinth, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Now as you read the two letters to Corinth from Paul that we have, it becomes pretty quickly obvious that his relationship with the Christians in Corinth was often contentious. Many in the church had listened to false apostles who came in and saw it and said that Paul was weak. He wrote tough letters, but when he showed up, he was just a marshmallow, and he was a real apostle. Earlier in this chapter, Paul tells him that he's coming to Corinth for the third time. And this time, if things are not in order, he's ready to come in strength, using his apostolic authority to judge those that are unruly. And then the context for verse 5 just breathes out of verse 3. Let's look there at verses 3 and 4. Since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him. But in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. Since you see proof that Christ is speaking in me, then in verse 5, examine yourselves. What Paul is saying is, you Corinthians want me to prove that Christ is speaking through me? You're the ones who need to face the test. You need to test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Paul was turning the tables on them. Then in verses 6 and 7, he goes on to write, I hope you'll find out that we have not failed the test. But we pray to God that you may not do wrong. Not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. In gentle humility, Paul expresses hope that the Corinthians will recognize the hand of God on him and his co-workers for the sake of the Corinthians, not for the sake of Paul and his co-workers. That was the good he hoped that they would do, that they would see the hand of God in his ministry, recognize he was called by God, was an apostle. And his primary concern is not his reputation, but the well-being of the believers in Corinth. And they knew they could not be where they needed to be spiritually as long as they were in rebellion against the apostolic authority that God had given him. We pray for you to avoid doing wrong, not to show how effective our ministry to you was, but for your sake, even if people think that we have failed. Now, before I move on here talking about testing yourselves to see if you're in Christ, I want to state very clearly that I firmly believe in the security of the believer. Christ died for a certain unshakable salvation. The solid old theologians didn't use words like once saved, always saved, or eternal security. You read their writings and you see they call it the perseverance of the saints. The same idea, but a very important, subtle difference. The idea of the perseverance of the saints is that those of us who are truly born again will continue to live in the faith and continue growing in faith and persevere in living for Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. If someone doesn't continue in the faith, the, the, the Apostle John tells us they never were in the faith. They were the seed that sprung up but quickly withered. Now true believers may stumble, that we will stumble, 
They, they may wonder now and then, but the Spirit keeps drawing us back. Not because we're so wise or so good, but because He is so powerful. For His own purposes, He has chosen us for His glory. They are saved by faith, and over it all, it shows by their lifestyle and values. But you and I need to periodically stop and examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. Not to create uncertainty, but to make sure and actually create certainty. We need to do some prayerful self-examination, and as Peter says, make our calling and election sure. Asking ourselves questions like, am I trusting the death and resurrection of Christ to pay for my sins? Or am I trusting the fact that I think that I'm better than others? I think I don't sin as much as my neighbor. Am I trusting the unmerited grace of God in Christ to save me? Or am I trusting the good works that I do? Or, or how religious I think I am? Is there more of the image of Jesus, more of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in my life now than there was when I first believed? Am I making some positive impact on others for Christ? Building other believers up, planting seeds in unbelievers that some come to Christ? Is my understanding of the core doctrines of the faith growing? Do I often feel the witness of the Holy Spirit in my heart that I am a child of God? In this passage, Paul says to the Corinthians, and I believe it says to us, examine yourselves, test yourselves. Now, your report card spiritually may be like mine used to be and say, can do much better, performs under his or her ability. But the good news is that's still a passing grade. It means you're spiritually alive, but you have room to grow. And my suspicion is that all of our report cards will have that in there somewhere. We're a work in process. Not what we used to be by the grace of God, but not yet what we're going to be when we see Christ face to face and we're changed into his image in an instant. Now, another way of phrasing the test is found in the CSB study Bible. And the note says this. Profession of faith and possession of faith are two different matters. Paul would surely have agreed with the three tests for assurance of salvation identified in 1 John. The doctrinal test, believing the truth about Jesus Christ, 1 John 2, 22 to 23. The moral test, living according to Christ's commands, 1 John 2, 3 and 4. The moral test, living according to Christ's commands, 1 John 2, 3 and 4. And the love test, love for God, and love for those in God's family. 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Those are the basic criteria, and we need to periodically stop and examine ourselves, test ourselves, and let the Holy Spirit witness to us, okay, you don't have it down pat yet, but there is evidence I'm in you, I'm working in you, and you're going to eventually see Christ face to face and be like him at that moment. Moving on in 2 Corinthians 13, verses 8, 9, and 10. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. For this reason I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. There in verse 9, do you see Paul's unselfish focus? He's praying for the Corinthians to be restored. He's saying that even if I'm weak and my workers are weak, I rejoice if you're strong. And there may be some gentle sarcasm there. But it was all about the good of the people that he ministered to. They could call him weak. They could think that he was a failure. He admitted that he had weaknesses. But the welfare of the people he ministered to, the welfare of the believers in Corinth, was the focus of his prayers. Now, is Paul praying for the restoration or, or for the perfection? I'll bring that question up because the ESV, the English Standard Version, and the New International Version translated there, praying for the restoration. The King James Version says he prays for their perfection. 
Many translations lean on the perfection side with a little different flavor to it, translating something like, your maturity is what we pray for. Your completeness is what we pray for. And the Greek is somewhat ambiguous. The word used there has both of those directions in it. One scholar says it denotes ability gained through training, disciplining, and instructing. It denotes adequacy, full qualification, maturity. Now, one commentator, I think, very well pulls these two ideas together. And he writes, literally, perfect restoration. Literally, that of a dislocated limb. And another does a very good job also saying it like this. They pray that the Corinthians may be made perfect. The process of making someone perfect is that of restoring him or her, Galatians 6, 1. Paul alludes to the spiritual restoration and perfection of the Corinthians, which in this earthly life will always remain a process. Amen to that. His request to God is that the Corinthians will mend their ways, and then as the body of Christ live in conformity with the teachings of the gospel. Restoration can only come by forsaking evil practices, striving to do good, living harmoniously with fellow believers, and obeying God. You might say that Paul was praying for the Corinthians to really get it together in Christ. Again, the Christian Standard Bible translates that we also pray that you become perfectly mature. As we become perfectly mature, we are restored. We are moving toward perfection. Our Gospel reading tells us of Jesus commanding the church to make disciples of all nations. And it's important to notice there, he didn't say go into all the world and make converts. He said go and make disciples. A convert can make a one-time decision and then just go on with the rest of their life and nothing happened. But has something actually happened or not? A disciple comes to Christ, is taught by others, sees good examples, hears good teaching, and begins the process of growing to be more like Christ. It's not the will of God for anyone to be saved and fail to grow in the image of Christ. If you are not maturing in Christ and becoming a disciple, you are out of the will of God. And our values have to be shifted from what where they started at toward the values of the kingdom of God. Don't let CNN or Fox News shape your values. Don't let some rock star or athlete or politician or news commentator shape your values. Let the word of God shape your values. Don't evaluate the word through the grid of something else. Evaluate all those other things out there by the word of God. This is rock bottom. This is rock solid. No matter what anyone else says, no matter what I may say, judge that by the word of God. Because all human beings err and err. But the word of God is perfect and true. In verse 10, a good paraphrase of verse 10 comes from the message where it's rendered like this. The authority the master gave me is for putting people together, not taking them apart. I want to get on with it and not have to spend time on reprimands. Paul saw that his authority wasn't to make him look big and it wasn't for tearing people down. He was responsible to God to use his apostolic authority to build people up. Paul was praying this letter would be enough to get the Corinthians to reject the false teachers and repent. He didn't want to deal harshly when he got there, but he would if that's what it would take to get the Corinthians on the right track spiritually, because that was his bottom line. Not his popularity, not his polling numbers. His bottom line was seeing the people he ministered to shape into the image of Jesus Christ. And he didn't want to have to be harsh about it. A good spiritual shepherd tries to avoid unnecessary conflict. But he must be ready to go head to head if that is in the best interest of the sheep committed to his charge. The focus for anyone in ministry, lay or ordained, has to be on building God's people up, not tearing them down. Need to battle against Flesh, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, 
and spiritual wickedness in high places. It's always important to remember who the enemy really is, and it's never another human being. The enemy is not any human spiritual leader, it's not any human political leader, it's not your fellow church member who believes differently than, than you do. If we're thinking like that, we're thinking wrong. The enemy is always the devil and his demons. And human beings are often pawns, sometimes willing pawns. But our job is not to judge them, it's not to beat them down, it's to pray for them, to love them, and to let the Holy Spirit do his work. Then in verse 11, the apostle writes, Finally, brothers and sisters, goodbye. Mend your ways, accept encouragement, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. That's a good translation there. The English Standard Version again says, aim for restoration. The King James Version says, be perfect. And again, they're working with the same Greek word there as in verse 9. And again, the idea is work through the process of restoration and healing, becoming more mature, more complete in Christ. When he says accept encouragement, I think the idea there is don't forget Eeyore. You remember Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh? Always saw things gloomy and dark. Always moaning and groaning. Don't be like that. Don't be a negative Ned. Be open to sisters and brothers trying to lift you up. You ever have someone that you just love, but every time you try to encourage them, they come back with a negative? You say, boy, it's a sunny day today. And they say, yeah, but it's going to rain. You say, well, the economy's starting to pick up. So, well, it might after I go bankrupt. Don't be a negative man. Be open to encouragement when it's offered to you. The scripture says, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Many of the people in Corinth were contentious, quick to argue, quick to fight. Paul urges them to be more Christ-like and work to get along with each other. And he said, if they do, the God of love and peace would be with them. There'd be blessing if they only tried to get along and live in love with each other. And this is true for us as well. If we work getting along with us, then the God of love and peace will be with us and bless us. Verse 12 says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Obviously, Paul wrote before the coronavirus. This was a warm cultural greeting. Many European cultures, Arab cultures, still use a non-passionate kiss like this. In context, what Paul wanted was he wanted them to do what was culturally acceptable, but I think there's a strong implication here. Don't just do it because you do it. Lay aside all of that strife, all that bickering that's, that's going on, and use this to express brotherly love for one another. Verse 14 should sound very familiar. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. An apostolic blessing that we use often at the end of morning prayer. This verse is the reason why this passage is read on Trinity Sunday because it's part of the foundation for the doctrine of the Trinity. As Paul just flowed in this beautiful Blessing and benediction. The gospel recorded Jesus telling us to baptize in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our Old Testament reading showed the work of the Father, the Word, and the Spirit in creation. Again, all three parts, three members of the Trinity working together to bring this universe into existence. And now the inspired apostle pronounces a beautiful blessing invoking the Lord Jesus Christ, God, and the Holy Spirit as equals. Now this was revolutionary to the Jewish mind, and any good Jewish believer coming into the faith would know breathing the Father, Son, and Spirit together in this way what was declaring that they were equal. You didn't talk about anyone else alongside God like this except God. And it points us toward the doctrine of the Trinity. As we open to growth in the Christian faith, 
we're drawn to see that we are created by the triune God, saved by the three in one, and we walk in loving fellowship with the Holy Trinity. Now, backing up to where we started, I hope you don't suffer from test anxiety. But the Word of God calls you to examine yourself and test yourself to make sure that Jesus Christ is in you. Are you trusting the cross? Is there evidence that the Holy Spirit is changing you step by step? Are you holding to the truths that the apostles taught, including the wonderful, beautiful mystery of the Holy Trinity? The message paraphrases that last verse beautifully. The amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. Please stand. Let's recite our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. At the home, if you're following it in the Book of Common Prayer, is found on page 127. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, Almighty maker, maker of, of heaven, heaven and earth, earth of all that is, visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified and the conscious pilot. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, we praise you for you. Amazing, incomprehensible, and yet revealed to us in majesty, in love, in grace. Oh Lord, forgive us when we think that we understand you completely. Forgive us when we're lazy and we don't dig in to study more about you. Oh Lord, I thank you for the faithfulness of your Holy Spirit that keeps drawing us back. It won't let us be complacent. It won't let us settle for mediocrity and sin. Oh, Lord God, as we wander, keep drawing us back. And Lord, as we grow, may we wander less and less, less often and less far from you. Lord, touch the hearts of each person here, each person who watches this, that our hearts will be drawn to love you with a fervent love, and Father, we pray for our world today, praying, Lord God, that there would not be a second wave of the coronavirus, but that it would continue to fade, that the deaths would continue to go down. Lord, we pray for a continued increase of peace on the streets of America. Lord, we pray that the people of our nation would move away from divisiveness and hatred, 
Lord, I pray that the eyes of your people, the church, would be open to seek love, to seek unity, Lord, that the church would be a voice of reason, drawing this divided nation toward love, toward unity, toward fairness and justice for all, regardless of color, black or white or yellow or brown. Holy Lord, this world has never been what it should be and will not be until the King comes. But Lord, let us not give up, but let us persevere in putting forth the values of the kingdom and strong love and firm gentleness and the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I hold before you the needs of your people. With all going on, there's still illness, there's still sickness, there's still poverty, there's still bills coming in, people only slowly returning to work. Lord God, be with your needy people, provide for our needs, give us faith to trust you as our provider. And Lord, we pray in all these things that you will guide us to bring glory and praise to your holy name. Heavenly Father, Grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in His great mercy, His promise, forgive us of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to Him. Have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to Him. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. spirit. And share the sign of peace with one another, staying in place and smiling and waving. Thank you. you may be seated. Just a few quick announcements. Uh, those here, check your bulletins, and, and you'll find the few announcements we have. Those at home, you can check our church Facebook page and find them there. Also at our web page, just quickly mention that we are continuing to do morning prayer. Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday at 8.30, live casting. Wednesday at 9 o'clock, live casting, and also having the doors open for those who desire to come. And on Wednesday morning, we are doing Holy Communion from reserved elements for those who come. Because there are some that are more comfortable coming to that smaller service rather than to this small service. <laughs> and we are trying to accommodate and meet the spiritual needs of, of all of our church body as best we can. And uh, we want to thank all of those who are faithfully giving and supporting the work, um, even through the time that the doors were not as open as they are right now. The bills still kept coming in, and you were faithful, and God was faithful through you. And, and we thank you and, and praise Him. And this time we're going to receive the, the offering. And as we've been doing, just come forward one at a time and leave your gifts in the offering of place. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself said it's more blessed to give than to receive. So please come and share your gifts. Thank you. 